for your love and grace. We thank you for the provision that was offered so freely there at the cross of Calvary, uh, your own beloved son. We thank you, Lord, that we have your word, and we pray now that as we study it, may we have a clearer and deeper understanding of uh, how you work in the lives of the believer today. We thank you for all who are in here, and we certainly are mindful of those not able to be with us this morning, many of those who are experiencing difficulties, whether uh, in infirmities or, uh, or other uh, distresses in life. We just pray that we would uh, be available to them and, and always have that uh, willingness to serve and to minister. We just pray that our time together would be a blessing, may it encourage, and uh, may it certainly edify. And we ask these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, let's turn to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Uh, this morning is lesson number 20. Uh, I'm sorry, lesson number 19 in our study here on Calvinism. And as I mentioned last time, next Sunday will be our final uh, lesson in our series on Calvinism. What I want to do this morning, as well as next Sunday morning, is look at the issue of the law. Okay, And the reason for that is uh, Calvinism, whether it's old school Calvinism, uh, the garden variety type of Calvinism, or even new Calvinism, and I'll say a a couple of things about that in just a few moments, whether it's old Calvinism or, quote, new Calvinism, um, there is this idea that the law, the Mosaic law, specifically the moral law, is still a system by which believers today need to adhere to for our growth and sanctification. And what I want to do, obviously, this morning as well as next Sunday morning, is demonstrate that we are not under the law. God today does not tell the believer to return back to the law system. So that's what we're going to do for the next two Sundays. Then I will be in Montana the next, the following Sunday. And then I guess the beginning of September, we're going to start studying the book of First Corinthians, okay? That's what we plan to do uh, beginning in September. We're going to now uh, get into First Corinthians, okay? So with all of that said, this morning we're going to look at the issue of the law versus grace, okay? And I want to start here in Acts chapter 15, uh, because I think this will provide a setting. The issue of the law uh, has been uh, a battleground for over 2,000 years. And um, as I mentioned, the religious system uh, is going to use the law as a means of controlling the believer. And, and we're going to just kind of develop all of this. But, but it's interesting when we read here in Acts chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation. So obviously, if it wasn't a small disputation or a small dissension, then what was it? This was a very heated exchange, okay? Paul had no tolerance for anyone to impose the legalistic system of Mosaic law upon a Christian today. Paul would fight, not because he was just, you know, uh, a naturally, you know, re, you know reviling, uh, railing kind of uh, individual, but he understood the shackles and he understood the bondage that the law system uh, puts on the believer today. So, uh, verse 2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Now, our purpose is not to examine what's going to happen here, but it is interesting to know that Paul evidently didn't have an interest to do that. If you study Galatians, the book of Galatians is Paul's account of Acts chapter 15. Paul never says he complied with the suggestion to go to Jerusalem to uh, deal with this issue. 
Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2 that he goes to Jerusalem by revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, the Lord Jesus is the one who appears to the Apostle Paul and instructs Paul to go to Jerusalem. So the reason Paul goes to Jerusalem is by revelation, not by way of suggestion uh, of these uh, apostles and so forth, all right? Um, These uh, individuals, these leaders, okay? Verse 3. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. Now look at verse 5. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them. And here we go. And to command them to keep the law of Moses. Listen, that mentality, that uh, way of thinking has been operating for 2,000 years. We see it already at the early stages of the church in Acts chapter 15. This is a battle which has been raging for over 2,000 years. The idea, as the end of verse 5 says, uh, command to keep the law of Moses. Okay? That is the battleground issue. Uh, Reformed theology, Calvinism, new, old, uh, hybrid, it doesn't matter. The institutionalized religious system is going to, in some way, shape, or form, impose a system of law upon believers today. Okay? Now, there are uh, two ways. Let's go to the book of Galatians here. As I mentioned just moments ago, the book of Galatians is Paul's commentary about this controversy that the Apostle Paul is going to stop dead in its tracks. Paul had no... uh, 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 any kind of affinity for, Paul had no tolerance for the imposition of Mosaic law, okay? So let's see how Paul is going to address this issue in Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto what? Another gospel. Now look at verse 7, which is... Not what? Another. Now it seems rather, you know, contradictory here. Wait, wait a minute. How is it in one sense another gospel, but in another sense, it's not another gospel? A real simple way of maybe understanding what the Apostle Paul here is saying you have things that can be viewed as being another type. And then you have things that can be viewed uh, as being something different of the same type. I don't want to confuse anybody, but for example, is an apple and an orange one and the same thing? No, they're, they're, they're different, right? An apple and an orange are two different things, but are they the same type of thing? Let's Think about an apple and an onion. Is an apple and an onion the same thing? No. Are they the the same type of anything? No. An apple would be viewed as a fruit and an onion would be viewed as what? A vegetable. So this is a very rough illustration. You can have an apple and an orange. An orange is another type of what? fruit, but it isn't the same thing as an apple. An onion is not only not the same as an apple, but it's a completely different kind of thing. You see the difference? You can have something different of the same kind, or you can have something different of a completely different kind. The Apostle Paul here, when he says in verse 6, that there are removed from him uh, that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is what? Not another. Listen, 
There is another gospel in the word of God. It's not the same as Paul's gospel, but it is a scriptural gospel. It's a different gospel of the same kind. You have the gospel of the kingdom. You have the gospel of God. You have the gospel of the circumcision. You have the gospel of the uncircumcision. You have the gospel of of Christ. You have the gospel of grace. Listen, they're not all one and the very same thing, okay? So uh, just to simplify things here, the Apostle Paul is warning the Galatians, do not be victimized by another gospel message, which is not another, not some bizarre uh, uh, type of a different kind. But wait a minute. It is scriptural. It is a scriptural body and system of truth. But it's not the gospel or the system of truth that is to be operating today in the dispensation of the grace of God. Now, let me ask you this. Is the Mosaic law scriptural? My goodness. It was a system imposed upon the nation of Israel for over 1,500 years, historically. Is Mosaic law in the Bible? Is the Mosaic law intended to be obeyed? certainly by the nation of Israel. It's scriptural. It's biblical. It was a legitimate operating system that God himself instituted and set up and gave and imposed upon the nation of Israel. So it's in the Bible. Does that mean, by default, that just because it's in the Bible, we're supposed to obey it today? You see, that's what Paul is trying to communicate here. Listen. It's a legitimate, Bible-based, scripturally supportive operating system, the law. And it's the carrot stick principle. Hey, be a good little boy and girl, and God will reward you. Be a bad little boy and girl, and I might punish you. The law principle is simply you are rewarded based upon your performance. You do and you get. Okay, that, that in a nutshell is the law system. It's that legalistic principle that is determined upon one's performance management, up, upon one's ability to, to live and, and, and to work and to do. And God made some promises. He says, listen, you are faithful. You do well. I will bless you. I'm on your side. You will curry my favor. I will defend you. I will bless you. On the other hand, listen, and you misbehave and you violate my laws. You transgress the rules and the code and the instruction and the ordinances and the specific laws that I give to you. You violate them. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to chastise you. I'm going to withdraw the blessing. I'm going to make your life miserable. And you know what Paul is saying? Yeah, that is a scriptural System. It's a legitimate operating principle in another dispensational setting. What the Apostle Paul here is establishing in the book of Galatians is quite simply, I will not allow anyone to put back upon the believer today the yoke of bondage called the law. So we got to appreciate what Paul is doing in the book of Galatians. Now, let's go back to chapter 1, verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would, here we go, pervert the gospel, the good news, that that system of revelation called uh, the good news of who? Christ. There are two ways in which these legalists are going to pervert. To pervert something means you render it uh, uh, neutral. You render it of none effect. Number one, the first way they pervert the gospel of Christ is they would teach that people are saved. They receive eternal life, the, the righteousness of God Almighty, that people are saved unto eternal life, number one, by works. And that person now 
is also sanctified. That is, they grow and they develop onto spiritual maturity by work. So the first way the gospel of Christ is perverted is when they teach salvation by works and they teach sanctification by works. Can you name a religious system that teaches you have to be good to go to heaven and you have to be good to stay saved lest you lose Some of you came right out of that monstrous system. Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism teaches you've got to earn heaven. Heaven is a reward for good behavior. You can never go to heaven unless you work for it. And then they would teach to keep God on your side, you have to maintain an unbroken life of Good works, okay? So the first way, the gospel of Christ, the pure gospel of grace, that liberating message of all that Jesus Christ accomplished on our behalf is by teaching you get to heaven by being good and you stay saved and you grow in godliness through a system of good works. The second way in which the gospel of Christ is perverted is what you find far more commonly within the ranks of Christendom. Okay, you're saved by grace, but you're sanctified by good works. So now you get into, well, you know, you, you got to repent of your sins. You got to confess your sins and and you got to maintain your your your, your salvation. And, and now there's all sorts of. Gifts. So the second way in which the gospel of Christ is perverted is when the system teaches, OK, you're saved by grace, but you're sanctified by works. So the first perversion is a graceless gospel. How much grace is in that first tactic of perversion? None. Now, I know what Roman Catholicism would teach. Well, no, God gives you the grace to do the good works, okay? We're not going to argue semantics here. The the bottom line is this. Saved by works, sanctified by works. It's a graceless system. There is no grace in it. I'm sorry. The second tactic is, well, you're saved by grace, but you're sanctified by works. So what you have here is this mixture of what? Law and grace. And by the way, that's what Paul is going to really go after here when he writes to the Galatians. The Galatians were being lured and seduced by deception into that second type of perverted gospel, which teaches, but by the way, there's also elements there that actually believe you got to be good to get to heaven and so forth, where uh, they're being led to believe that you're perfected. Go real quickly. Our intention is not to go through the book of Galatians, but just notice, for example, Galatians chapter 3. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Um, <laughs> Boy, Paul is writing about me here. Look at this. Galatians chapter one, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, what foolish, unthinking Galatians. Who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth what? Christ- Listen. To believe that the law has any place or purpose in your life today is to deny the the crucifixion, the work of the cross. And that's what Paul's getting at. You are denying the full merits of Calvary if you resort back to a human performance-based system of conditional acceptance. Listen. Any and all acceptance and favor and forgiveness and love is not dependent upon your ability or lack thereof. It depends solely on what Jesus Christ did for us. Okay? And when the Apostle Paul, he he writes, I love the way he does that. Jesus Christ evidently what set forth crucified among you. Listen, the details of all that Jesus did for us on the cross should be so crystal clear in our thinking. We see it, not literally, but we see it with the eyes of our what? Understanding, okay? Now look at verse 2. 
This only would I learn of you. Receive thee the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Now, these questions are intended to get these foolish people to think. Think about this. Verse 3. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by what? See, that's the second type of perversion. Just mix a little bit of flesh and fleshly performance. And the law operating system is based upon one's ability to adhere to it in full compliance. Okay? So Paul, he's wondering, well, you're, you can't be perfected. You cannot grow to spiritual adulthood via the law program, all right? So that only leaves one other option, doesn't it? Remember, the first idea, saved by, uh, saved by works, sanctified by works. The second view is, well, okay, you can be saved by grace, but you need to be good to earn it or to keep it and so on and so forth. Listen, there's only one clear understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is you're saved by grace and you're sanctified by grace. Okay, And Paul fought tooth and nail throughout the course of his entire life after he became the apostle of the Gentiles to maintain the purity and the integrity of the grace of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Okay, Critically, critically important here. Okay, So, in light of Calvinism, Calvinism... And, and again, now, now obviously we, we're, we're familiar with the old school type of Calvinism. We're, we're somewhat familiar with Reformed theology. But be careful. There is, in recent uh, few, last few decades, something called New Calvinism. And we address some of the New Calvinist uh, teachers and leaders, whether it's Piper. There's one guy. Let me quote this guy. Uh, his name is Fuller. And uh, kind of interesting here. If you say, do you believe that... A believer today, a Christian today, is obligated to live under the law. They kind of withdraw a little bit. And they say, well, a better way of saying this is, quote, we follow the precepts of the Holy Spirit. Now, first you think, oh, okay. But, but now... Look there at Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath what? Bewitched you. Oh, no, wait, wait. We're not saying that you are required to adhere to the letter of the law. Watch out. But, you know, we are supposed to follow the precepts of the Holy Spirit. So Fuller was asked the question, well, um, how many precepts are there? And you know what Fuller's answer was? Thousands. What's the difference between following the law or following the precepts of the Holy Spirit? You know what they're doing? You see what they just did? They took the same old content and they just packaged it up with a nice, pretty little bow. All they did was change the language. A rose by any other name is still a rose. When you begin to dig deeply, whether it's Fuller or Piper or MacArthur, and, 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 you know, we can name all these guys, right? We did that in the beginning of our series. You find out that they fundamentally believe the same old doctrine, but they word it in a more appealing, palpable way. See, they say, oh, no, no, let's just follow the precepts of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean, by the way? Follow the precepts of the Holy Spirit. You see, isn't that kind of ambiguous? What does that mean? You see how they got you? Well, how many do I have to follow? Thousands of them. Can, oh, can you follow the thousand? Now, I'm not going to argue how many specific laws there were, were under the Mosaic system. Uh, can you follow all of those laws under the Mosaic system? So why is it easier to follow the precepts? Of the Holy Spirit. And I'll show you how they do that, all right? But for right now, I just want you to appreciate what the system out there 
whether it's Reformed, Old Calvinism, or even New Calvinism. By the way, there are New Calvinists that actually still believe all of this, okay? For example, if you go to their documents, you go to their system of belief, uh, they will say that the believer today is still obligated to the moral law. Now, I want you to understand, this is how they do that. When you talk about Mosaic law, go back to Acts chapter 15, very, very quickly, Acts chapter 15. Now, remember what we read in verse 5. When they talk about the law, okay, what they do, and by the way, Aquinas, back in wherever that was, 1400s or wherever he was, what they did centuries ago is they dissected the Mosaic law into three parts. And some of you are familiar. By the way, there's a little bit of merit, but, but just for right now. What you will find is the law, the Mosaic law is divided, ceremonial, and then you have the moral. So what, this is how the law is viewed, okay? Uh, the Mosaic law is dissected into three categories. You have what is called the civil or national laws of Israel, Okay. Uh, governing, uh, obviously, the, the administrative and bureaucratic, and, and, and you had civil laws, and we're going to look at a couple of examples here. So you had, under the Mosaic law, what is deemed or termed as civil laws, okay? Uh, there are certain things that uh, the nation, an eye for an eye, and what? A tooth for a tooth, which, by the way, is completely misunderstood, you know, it isn't, oh, you took my eye, I'm going to take yours. No, you took that guy's eye, you give him yours. You see the difference there? You know, you, you know how often you hear people say, hey, eye for an eye. They use that verse to justify retribution. See that? You hurt me, the Bible says I have a right to hurt you. You offend me, you, you, you rob me, the Bible says eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and I'm going to get my just desserts. You see that? You see how, how carnal, you see how the sinner carnalizes God's word? Isn't that convenient? So I have a Bible passage that justifies retribution. The eye for the eye principle, which is a civil law, by the way, uh, it isn't if somebody offends you, somebody burns you, somebody takes from you, you now take from them. The eye for the eye, uh, tooth for the tooth principle is, is, listen, if my action, my behavior, my conduct results in you losing an eye, you losing a tooth, you being robbed, defrauded, and offended, I now sacrifice my eye and tooth for them. You see the difference there? And yet, what does the sinner do? Oh, I want the right to take from you when God says you have an obligation to give to them when you take from them. I didn't mean to get into all that. My point is this. That would be uh, uh, under the so-called civil or national law of Israel. So this is what the Calvinist system is going to do. Well, wait a minute. Since the church has replaced Israel, then we're no longer under it. See that? You see the way they think now, right? Okay, Mosaic Law, three parts, civil, ceremonial, and moral, right? Well, okay, uh, the church has replaced Israel, although old school Calvinists would tell you that Israel is still the church, okay? We're not going to get into all that. So therefore, we're not under civil. Well, what about ceremonial law? Okay, well, Jesus Christ, he, you know, there were ceremonial laws, uh, for example, you know, the priests, they, they couldn't burn certain types of incense. And what's his name? I forgot. Uh, he, he touched the ark, for example. Uh, there were Selma. Uh, 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 remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. See, there's some things that are going on. So you have ceremonial. Oh, okay, so the argument is this. Well, Jesus, he's the fulfillment of all the types and shadows of ceremony, right? He's the Passover, for example, and he's the Feast of Tabernacles and so on and so forth. So because Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the types and shadows and figures, we're not under ceremonial law. So there's a third part to the system called Mosaic Law, called the what? Moral Law. Now, the thing that we want to be extremely careful about is, wait a minute, who, who came up 
with this tripart system. Who says that you can toss out two parts but keep one other part? So this is what the system of religion will teach. The moral law is binding. And and they'll call it the eternal law. Well, wait a minute. Wrong is wrong and right is right. And, you know, thou shalt not kill, for example. Well, wait a minute. Is it still wrong to kill? Murder. What are you going? Is it still wrong to rob and still wrong to steal and it's still wrong to kidnap and so on and so forth? So you see, the moral law is still binding even for Christians today in this current dispensation of the grace of God. And, and we're going to get to some of these verses because after all, Paul, he refers to the moral law. Look at verse 5. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, they're arguing circumcision. What part is circumcision part of the moral law? Is circumcision part of the ceremonial law? Is circumcision part of the civil law? Wait a minute, who now begins to decide where it belongs? Let me ask you this. You know what? There are moral elements and moral applications to the civil law. There are moral applications and moral elements to the ceremonial law. We've got to be very careful. If somebody arbitrarily decides that, yes, we throw out civil, we throw out ceremony, but the moral law is still a system that the Christian today is obligated to keep. Be careful. Who says? Well, well, because Paul refers to it. For example, go to Romans chapter 13. And you know, okay, let me say this right now because I know we're never going to have enough time. There are occasions where the Apostle Paul is going to refer to the law. Okay? He's going to refer to the law. And let me want to say this. Not one time, when, if and when the Apostle Paul refers to the law, never, ever, at any moment, is he suggesting we return back to that system. You see what I just said? Does Paul refer to the law? Yeah. Yeah. Does he do so to teach believers we're still under it? No. Does he refer to the law to demonstrate we got to go back to it? No, 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 in no way, shape, or form. Please, you got to really understand. Because just because Paul makes a reference to the law does not teach we're back under the system. For example, Romans chapter 13. And if, uh, let me get over there real quickly. Romans chapter 13 and notice verse 8. Romans 13, verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath what? You see, we're under the binding moral law. Does that verse say anything about the Christian being bound to the moral law? Read it very carefully. He that loves, according to verse 8, hath what? Fulfilled what? The law. I hope you see what Paul is saying here. Listen, the law, with all of its mandates, fulfilled in one word, love. Think about that. Thou shalt not steal. Why would I steal from David if I love you? You understand what love does? Love fulfills the demands of the law. In essence, in spirit, fundamentally, the principle, the demands, the dictates, the expectations of the law can and are fulfilled if you love. That's all Paul is saying. He never says we got to get back down, back, back to that binding system. Look at verse 9. For this, love, thou shalt not what? Commit adultery. Listen, if I love my wife, would I commit adultery? But the law did say, thou shalt what? Not commit adultery. So, let me ask you this. Do I choose not to commit adultery 
because the law says I better not do it? Or do I choose not to commit adultery because I love my wife? See, that's the difference between viewing God as a judge or viewing God as a father. You see the difference there? Oh, the judge says, I forgive you. So, what does a forgiven sinner do if he views God as a judge who just said, I forgive you? You know what? I'm free to do it again, aren't I? You see, if you, if you view God as, as a judge who says, I will forgive you of your sin. You see this idea that grace is a license to loose living. Grace is a license to sin. Grace is a license to lasciviousness. Yeah, and medicine is designed to kill you, right? Is medicine intended to kill or to heal? Well, help me out here. (laughs) Now I know there's controversy. Is medicine intended to heal or to harm people? It's intended to heal. Is grace intended to give you license to sin or to empower you to stop sinning? Is electricity intended to provide electricity or is electricity intended to electrocute you? You see, the difference? if you view God as some hard, immovable, implacable judge who now says, I can forgive you. Okay, the judge said, I'm off the hook. So now guess what I'm going to do? But if you view God as a loving heavenly father and my father says, I forgive you, son. I want you to keep your finger here. Go to John chapter 8. Go to John chapter 8. I hope that you realize the relationship that we enjoy with our heavenly father is empowered by grace, not the law. We're going to, man, we're going to demonstrate The law never frees us. It it, it binds us. Paul calls it a system of bond. Grace frees us to live for our Father. John chapter 8, this is just an illustration of this. In John chapter 8, remember there was this woman who was caught in adultery, okay? And um, you, 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 look, verse 8, John chapter 8, ver, uh, verse 3, I'm sorry, John chapter 8, verse 3, and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, right? And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, the Lord Jesus, Master, this woman ha- was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. Now that's the law. You stone that adulterer to death, Right? So, okay, Jesus, what do you say about this, right? Now, of course, verse 6, this they said, tempting him that they might have uh, to accuse him. Ah, they already, they already understood some things about Jesus Christ and his view of the law, by the way. But So uh, he stoops down and he writes something in the ground. Verse 7, so when they continued asking him, he lifted, him, lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone, cast the stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Verse 9. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. And Jesus, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Let me ask you this. What what would motivate and compel this woman when he says sin no more? Stop with the adultery. That's what he's saying. What was the motive behind this woman stopping the adultery? I'm not going to condemn you. Think about that. If she said, oh, you're a good judge. Thank you. I'm going to continue practicing because you forgave me. Jesus says, I'm not going to condemn you. Go and sin no more. Love, forgiveness, grace, mercy, tenderheartedness is the most powerful motivation not 
to continue to sin. Not some legalistic judge who has a clipboard and a pen and every time you screw up, gotcha. Every time you slip, gotcha. Every time you fit, gotcha. Every time you fu- gotcha. God Almighty takes that clipboard of, of charges and accusations and the record of all of our sinful failure. And, G- and God Almighty, He nails it on the cross with His Son, Jesus Christ. And God the Father says, I will not condemn you for your sin. Go ahead and keep doing it or respond back to me as a father and sin no more. Oh, my goodness. God isn't just a judge who gets us off the hook. He's a father who adores us, who loves us, who values us with such unconditional fury. You know, people got this crazy idea and I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit because I want to talk about how does grace motivate the believer to live? Go over to Philippians chapter 3. I, I, I love history. We are just chatting here earlier about history, okay? So, I don't know. I, I guess I've been on sort of a mission to read about all of the presidents of the United States. So, anyway, long story short, I've been reading about Eisenhower. You're familiar with that? We're just talking about Dunkirk, right? Uh, historic and so forth. And... Um, I was reading about Eisenhower. Some of you were actually there when <laughs> he was supreme commander of Allied forces, World War II, right? Five-star general. By the way, do you know that there was somebody who had more stars than, uh, than Eisenhower? Not during World War II, but during the Civil War. Did you know that we actually gave uh, six stars to Grant? He was a six, did you know he was a six-star general? Wait, we got a captain in the Army. That's okay. I didn't know that either. But we actually had a six-star... Anyway, Eisenhower was a five-star... He was supreme commander, allied forces, okay? Just think about that for a second. Read, let's read Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Verse 4. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Now look at what Paul's going to do. Here's, here's Paul who's now going to brag about who he was. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Man, he was an eighth day circumcised Jew. That tells you something about the faithfulness of his father. He's as Jewish as you can get. Not seventh day, not ninth day. According to the strict, I mean the law said the eighth day. Okay. Of the tribe of Benjamin. Why is he bragging about Benjamin? There's something about the tribe of Benjamin in history. And Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, what? Yes, and the Apostle Paul, he lived a life of brag and boast and pride. And he said, look at me. Look at who I am. Look at my achievement ethnically, nationally, religiously, spiritually. You cannot blame me in any one point, in failing to live up to the righteousness of the law. Eisenhower, right after World War II, of course, uh, the war is over, they defeated Nazism, and they crushed Germany, right? So, so uh, Eisenhower, he starts touring Western Europe, and all of the countries of Western Europe, they received Eisenhower as a conquering hero. He got medals and honors and parades, and, and, and he was uh, met with... with Thousands upon thousands of people cheering him. When he got to the United States, four to five million people lined the streets of New York City to welcome General Eisenhower and the great victory over over Nazi Germany. When he addressed Congress at that time, Eisenhower received the longest standing ovation in congressional history. When things began to settle, he wanted to go home to see his mother in Abilene, Kansas. So he finally gets to travel to Abilene, Kansas. He wants to see his mom, Ida. Uh, Abilene, Kansas at the time, population 5,000. Well, because it's Eisenhower, the town swells to 20,000 people. And so there was an afternoon where some of the reporters were allowed to enter into the home. And uh, there is Dwight's mother rocking in a rocking chair. And the reporters were given an opportunity to talk to, to Dwight Eisenhower's mom. And a journalist asked Dwight's mother, he asked, are you proud of your son? You know what she responded? Which one? 
Which one? You know, sometimes people think the more religious you are, the more God loves you. Now, there's two ways of looking at that. He had a brother, Milton, by the way. He had other siblings. Well, maybe mom thought, let's take this down just a notch. Or maybe mom was as proud of her other sons as he was of of Dwight. You see, that religious mentality, we think, the more we do, the more we religious, the more religious we are. The more accolades we receive from God Almighty. Oh, He's going to love you more. He's going to forgive you more. He's going to adore you more. He's going to forgive and accept you. And He's going to pour out His, his uh, extravagant, lavish love for you. Why? Because I earned it. You know what? God loves every one of His sons just the same. Here Paul brags about who he is in the flesh. And you know what? In that religious system, he expected accolades. He expected adoration. He expected notoriety. He expected reputation. And then you've got just the Joe who maybe can't perform, isn't capable of doing. And yet God the Father is as proud and loves that guy just as much as the guy who's out there bragging about all of his accomplishments in life. Is he proud of you? You know, if you can ask, hey, hey, God the Father, are you proud of your son? Yeah, he's proud of his son, Jesus Christ. Is he proud of you? Look at what Paul says in light of religion. Remember what he says there at the end of verse 5? As touching the law, Pharisee, verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the what? Blameless. Boy, did God love him because of all that? Did God accept him because of all of that performance? Now look what he says in verse 7. But what things were gained to who? To me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless. I love that. Without a doubt. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but what? Paul reviews his religiosity and his religious achievements and all of that that he could boast about. And he says it's just excrement. You know who really counts? Jesus Christ. He is everything. He is all in all. Jesus Christ is the center and circumference. He's our all in all. He's everything. And if you're in him, You are as forgiven, adored, valued, loved, accepted as as He is. We're accepted in the who? The beloved. Oh, man. God isn't sitting on a rocking chair saying, man, I'm more proud of Charlotte than I am of uh, Kyle. (laughs) Because she's far more holier and spiritual. Now, Kyle, there's some things you need to work on, but you know what? I love you equally. Because I love my son. Wow, grace blows away that, that, that whole system of self-performance, self-love, which is really a, a, nothing more than self-love. I love myself, ultimately. Let me read you what, what the religious system will do. The Westminster Confession of Faith, quote, the moral law doth forever bind all as well justified persons as as others to the obedience thereof, and that, not only in regard of the matter contained in it, but also in respect of the authority of God the Creator who gave it, neither doth Christ in the gospel any way dissolve, but much strengthens this obligation. You know what the system of religion teaches? Listen, not only did Jesus not do away with the law, He's actually strengthened the moral obligation that the Christian is now under. When they say the moral law is binding, they mean it. Uh, The Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, uh, word for word. Now, uh, we don't have time. I, 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 I want to read this. If you want to know how convoluted I, that's why I kind of wanted to read it. It is so bizarre. Um, the, the confession of faith would say that the, the Ten Commandments are still binding. Okay? Um, 
Where is the moral law summarily comprehended? Answer, this is, by the way, the Westminster Larger Catechism. Okay, This is Reformed theology. This is where Calvinism uh, plants it, it, its feet on. Okay, uh, The moral law is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. Okay, uh, What rules are to be observed for the right understanding of the Ten Commandments? For the right understanding of the Ten Commandments, these rules are to be observed. And I'm, I'm not kidding. There's a whole page of rules on how to obey the Ten Commandments. And, and I, I would love to read it all because I, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. It is just absolutely, absolutely convoluted. My point is this. The Apostle Paul never, ever go to Romans chapter 7. Now, I tell you what, we'll, we'll use this passage to prepare everybody for next Sunday, okay? Here's your homework. List every occurrence where the Apostle Paul speaks positively about the law. Yeah, I know, that's a lot of work, Romans through Philemon, okay? I understand that. Uh, but if you were to read Romans through Philemon this afternoon, I'm just joking, um, and you wrote down, how many times does Paul speak highly of the law? And then contrast it to how many times does Paul speak negatively about the law? And man, it, it is an eye-opening exercise. There are perhaps three occasions where Paul directly says something good about the law. For example, Romans chapter 7. Now, we're somewhat familiar, I hope, with this. Look at Romans chapter 7, verse 12. Wherefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and what? Good. Okay, that's an absolute truth. The commandment is Holy, the commandments, uh, listen, the law is holy, uh, 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 the commandment is holy, and it's just, and it's good. Paul is not saying, therefore, let's go back to it. Paul is demonstrating that it's going to be the problem. When Paul says it's holy, just, and good, he isn't saying, wow, let's go back to it. He's saying, It is the system of perfect righteousness that does its job. You know what the law ultimately does? It condemns us. And that's exactly what Paul is going to do here. Look there at verse 12 again. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment, might become exceedingly what? The law is not to help the sinner overcome sin. The law is to help sin overcome the sinner. Do you see the difference here? These individuals that are so blinded by religiosity, Oh, the law, it's holy, it's just and good. we got to get back to it because it's going to control and it's going to prevent sin. Paul is telling us the law doesn't help the sinner. It helps sin. And you think, how can you say that? Look at verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of what? Sins which were by the what? I thought the law stops sin. According to verse 5, does the law stop sin or does the law empower sin? You see what the law is doing? Go to chapter 5. Look there at Romans chapter 5. Now, now this, it's like ice cold water in the face of the modern day legalists. The law, we need the law. It'll keep your life righteous. You need the law to stop sin in your life. When Paul does say something positive, he's demonstrating the law doesn't help you. It helps sin. Because, and we'll see why God did that. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered. Why? That the offense might what? What? 
Paul writes to the Galatians, he says, the law was added because of transgressions. Wait a minute. And we'll go back there. But let's, let's finish verse 20 here. Now, now, let's read verse 20 again. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. You know what God did? He says, listen, I'm going to demonstrate who you are inside. Just like a two liter bottle of seven up. And you know what the law does? It takes you. And it starts to shake you. Boy, the other day I dropped the... Uh, man, I couldn't believe it. You ever do that with a can of pop? And, and I'm telling you, I had the pop like this, and I just kind of... It was just like this. I barely... I didn't drop it. It was sort of like I slipped and I caught it. I thought, I'm okay. And then I popped it. Guess what happened? I can't believe it. It doesn't take much. You know what the law... It doesn't take much law to reveal who you really are. It doesn't take a whole lot of law to flesh out what you're made of. And the law takes... The holy, just law system takes that worthless, dirty, foul, offensive sinner. And the law says, let's see what you... And starts shaking you up. And then what happens when you pop the top? What's inside comes out. The law reveals how sinful you are. The, the measuring tape measures how sinful you are. The thermometer, it measures how sinful you are. Listen, the thermometer can't get rid of the fever. The law can't get rid of sin. The thermometer reveals how much temperature you have. You know what the law does? It tells you how worthless you really are before the judgment seat of Almighty God. That law is like a measuring stick. Listen, that, 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 that tape measure doesn't make my eight-foot piece of lumber longer or shorter. It just reveals what it is. The law doesn't make you better. It, doesn't, it just reveals who you really are. And the law condemns each and every one of us. Guilty as charged. So God says, I'm going to give you the law to demonstrate how sinful you and I really are. Now, look at verse 20 again. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded. Now, remember what the law does. The law intensifies the sinfulness of the sinner. But where sin abounded, grace did, I love Paul line grammar. Grace did much more what? God Almighty met the holy just law uh, program and, and the manifestation of sin within the heart and nature of a sinner. God says, but my grace does much more. There is this exceeding super abundance of hyper grace. Oh, the sin, it condemns, it declares us guilty, and it pronounces the sentence of death. And God says the answer is grace. But not just grace, the super abounding grace. And we're going to pick it up next time. Listen, when God talks about grace, He's talking about the unconditional acceptance and favor and love and forgiveness and, 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 and all that God is doing regardless of what you've done, regardless of who you are. God's grace is not dependent upon what you deserve. It isn't dependent upon what you do not deserve. Otherwise, it isn't grace. It's God's unadulterated willingness to give to us everything we absolutely need to spend eternity in heaven's, glory, in heaven's glory with Him. Grace ultimately is a person, Jesus Christ. We come as we are, sinners in desperate need of a Savior. God's grace was put on display when he nailed his son, unsparingly nailed his son, Jesus Christ, on that cross being made sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We don't need religion. We don't need law. We don't need a legalistic program. We don't need a system of carrots and sticks and do and get and don't do and lose. We need God's grace. And it's in the cross. Next week, I want you besides this homework assignment, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 is going to tell us how the law works. 
and it's not intended to do what these theologians are trying to say about the law. Okay, Father, we do thank you for your love and your goodness and your grace. We thank you, Father, for what you did for us through your Son there on the cross where our dear Savior shed his blood richly, freely for those who were condemned as sinners, for those who were condemned as ungodly, for those who stood as the, as the very enemies of God we thank you that Jesus loved us and gave himself for us, that he died for sinners. But then, of course, how we rejoice knowing that he rose from the dead as a conquering hero, uh, eternally settling the sin debt. We thank you, Lord, for eternal life as a free gift by grace, uh, not by works of righteousness, which we uh, have done or, or could even ever possibly do, but by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of of God. We thank you, Father, for that gift, and we thank you for in Christ Jesus. Amen.